you have friends who are not in church this morning, but at, but at home in bed with somebody they shouldn't be, you may want to tell them to get on live stream. Uh, this, this might help them this morning. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we're going there this morning. So. <laughs> God in his wisdom has covered every situation in principle that a human being will ever deal with. And uh, Genesis 38 and 39 is there to help all of us with struggles that are common to all of us. We've entitled our message, Sex or No Sex in the City. And no, I don't watch the show. <clears throat> <laughs> we do live in a sex-saturated society. I'm, I'm always curious to see how preoccupied people are with sex. When, when men and women sit down to fill out an application and they see sex and then they see M or F instead of thinking male or female, they're wondering, are you asking monthly or frequently? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> God wants to teach us how to manage our sex drives in a biblical fashion. And you'll hardly find a more stunning contrast between how to do it, between the characters in Genesis 38 and 39, and a man who's going to stand out for you named Joseph. We all know choices bring consequences, and oftentimes the right choice doesn't pay off right away. Sin often brings quicker satisfaction than holiness, but holy choices bring a greater satisfaction that lasts longer. I need y'all to pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this privilege of hearing your word. I pray, Lord, that today would be just a a turning point for all of us, that we would just want to learn to worship you in the beauty of, of holiness. We pray, Lord, for for freedom, for deliverance, for a a standard of moral purity that will make an eternal difference for all of us. Open the eyes of our understanding as we study your word today. Help us to see why you say yes and no and wait and not now and wrong person and all of that, Lord. Help us learn what you want us to learn this day from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And let me say up front that that two of the characters that we're going to look at this morning that are going to show absolutely horrible sexual standards actually wind up in the bloodline of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, That's just to remind all of us what a great God we serve who can forgive and redeem and use people for his glory no matter what they may have done. Okay? I hope you've been tracking with us these past few weeks and we've been looking at Christ and work in Genesis and some of the people uh, that he used to even come through the bloodline and the 12 tribes of Israel. Last, last week we looked at the mistreatment of Joseph as he's been sold into slavery by his brothers. And then there's a side in chapter, a side in chapter 38 where you, we're going to see years of history from a man by the name of Judah. And we all know that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to identify himself as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But Judah didn't start off well. He finished well. And I often say it is better to finish well, even if you didn't start well. They they don't give out medals for people who ran the first hundred yards of the marathon. (laughs) <laughs> the goal is to finish. Okay. Genesis chapter 38, where God says, It came to pass at that time Judah departed from his brothers, visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He married her, went into her. They had sexual relations. Nothing wrong, they're married. So she conceived and bore a son, called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son. She called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son. 
and called his name Shelah. He was a Chezeb when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Let me pause there. Did, did you notice how many years just got covered in those few verses? So there are many times God just gives you a section of history to develop a point, then he'll pick up these characters later and maybe backtrack in the history. So don't, don't miss this. You've noticed that Judah is separated from his brothers. He's gone and got married. He's had sons, and now they're grown and old enough to be married. So obviously years have passed, okay? But notice that when he separated from his brothers after, and maybe because of all this commotion with how they dealt with Joseph, but he went and started hooking up with the Canaanites, with the pagans, with the idolaters, and, and right away a friend is mentioned who's a, a pagan. So he separated from his brothers, but he chose to get involved with other people that weren't godly. That's not a good thing. The Lord wants us to separate from sin and from idols to unite with him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 9 and 10, Paul tells the church at Thessalonica, you, you did well because you turned to God from your idols. You didn't just turn from your idols, you turned to God from idols to serve the living God. It's not enough to just come out of the world if you're not coming in to serve Christ. Remember the parable about the demons that have been cast out of the person, but he didn't allow the Holy Spirit to come into that empty house, and the next thing you know, here comes the demons back and having a family reunion inside of them. Some of y'all catch that later. <clears throat> So they're marrying these pagans, and he's, he's had three sons by his wife. And then verse 7 says, Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Now right away you say, wow, what did he do that God just took him out like? It's a good reminder to all of us that the God that we worship and love and take for granted and think he's going to just turn his head no matter what we do, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that basically say, as one friend used to say, God is a hitman. <laughs> you never know when he said, okay, I've had just about enough of you. I got billions more people. Not that I don't love you, but I can take you out of here. Yes. Yes, can. And when God says that, all of the Secret Service and FBI and CLT and whoever cannot stop you, cannot stop God from doing what he decides to do. So it's always better to live in holiness and do what he's asking you. He said... Ur did something so wicked that the Lord just took him out. So verse 8 says, Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife, marry her, raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. It came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he admitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore... God killed him also. But let's take a minute to process what the Holy Spirit just recorded. So both of Judah's, Judah's first two sons, Ur and Onan, are going to get killed by God for, for sinful actions. Now, now later on, as, as God gives Moses the law, he, we have something we call the Leverite marriage. And you, you saw that when... a uh, an older brother married a spouse and perhaps died without children. The, the law said that the brother, the unmarried brother, was to go and take her for a wife, raise up a descendant that would be considered the heir of the brother that had died. And then all the other children belonged to him. He's keeping the family line going. He's keeping the, the wife protected. His, so he had a reason for it. <clears throat> But Onan didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And 
All right, this, this is going to be kind of raw today, okay? The, the verse I just read about him emitting his seed on the ground, so, some of the old Bible teachers used to say he was masturbating. Come on, there's adults in this room, okay? All right, all right. That's really not what the text said. Okay, look, look closely. Are you there? Yes, sir. Verse 9. Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife, he emitted on the ground. What he was doing, look, look at the last sentence in letter B. He's using her sexually. Right. He's not masturbating. He's going into her repeatedly. They're having sexual relations, but he's pulling out, putting his semen on the ground rather than impregnate her to give her an heir like God wanted him to. And he's doing it over and over. and Oh, he's pleasing himself. Right. And he's using her. And God says, okay, I'm done with you. And killed him. But would you let that sink in for a minute? In a world that doesn't seem to care about sexual sin, God does. And he's telling you in Genesis, and we, we just believe, I can't prove it, but there was probably some sexual wickedness going on with the firstborn that got killed. So now he's killed on it. Some, some guys thought this was, was masturbating and named it onanism, thinking that's what he would know. He was having sexual relations and withdrawing so that he wouldn't impregnate her. Now, oh, she's in a bind now because she's lost one husband. This other husband is using her. She's never going to have an heir like this. God took him out. So now... It should be next man up. Verse 11. Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Sheila is grown. For he said, lest he also die like his brothers. Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Look at letter C, section 1. Judah sinned by not giving his next son to her. Was he... Scared? Two of my boys have died with her. I don't know if it's her cooking. I don't know if it's something else. But I don't want to lose my third son. And, but you see how selfish this was? This woman is being mistreated. All he cares about is his son's. So Tamar has been around this family, but she's being misused. And quick question, does that remind you of how you're treating somebody? See, the world is teaching us you take your satisfaction from someone else's body. And God says, no, you receive as you give. Your, your goal should be to give pleasure to someone else, and as you do so, you receive it in a proper biblical relationship. Okay? Let's read on. Verse 12, Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted. He went up to his sheep shears at Timnah. He and his friend, Hira, the Adulamite. It was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. Let, let me pause there for a second. Judah's wife has died, and people are comforting him, and now he's a widower, and his Canaanite boy said, hey, you know, it's sheep shearing time, everybody's going to be there, hang out, party, well, let's, let's go. So Judah goes. Verse 13 says, it was told Tamar, saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Sheila was grown 
and she was not given to him as a wife. You see how much time has passed? Three sons have grown up. I'm in section two now. Tamar had been wronged and made wrong choices trying to make things right. Our world is full of people who've learned to respond to their pain in a similar fashion. So she hears her father-in-law is going up to Timna where the sheep shearing is going to take place and all the other activities that go along with that, good and bad. So she dresses up like a prostitute. What does that tell you about Judah's character? That his daughter-in-law kind of knows that if I go dress like a prostitute, he's probably going to hit on me. I did say earlier he winds up in the family line of Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah. God is so gracious. To not be ashamed to identify with us after all the mess we have done. She dresses like a prostitute. Verse 15, Judah saw her, thought she was a prostitute. She had covered her face. She's looking seductive. Verse 16, he turned to her, by the way, and said, please, let me come in to you. But he didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law. He went up there to... The sheep shearing, and he's a widower, and we'll keep it real. He's been married, he's had children, he's used to being sexually active, and but he goes after a prostitute. Tamar pretended to be a prostitute to seduce her own father in law, make sure she wasn't left out of the family provisions. But the greater sin here is going to be committed by Judah, who's going to use her to satisfy his own lust and fill his own emptiness because he's a widower. Men are visually stimulated. I know that's not a newsflash for most of you. Ever since the Garden of Eden, When God put Adam to sleep, and the scripture says he fashioned, maybe he made Adam out of the dust of the ground, but he fashioned Eve. And when Adam came out of his sleep and saw, he said, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) So, so, So men are... By nature, love to look at beautiful. There's nothing wrong with that. It's when we cross the line with lust and then take advantage of someone that we shouldn't be in relationship with that causes the problem. So he sees this attractive-looking prostitute who is his own daughter-in-law. He doesn't recognize her. And he asks to hook up with her. Tamar's pretty smart. Here, look at verse 16. She said, well, what will you give me that you may come into me? Verse 17, I'll send a young goat from the flock. She said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? She said, your signet and your cord and your staff that's in your hand. Would would you let that sink in? Hey, can, can we hook up? Yeah, what you going to give me? Uh, 20 bucks. Uh, can I have your credit card, your driver's license, and your car keys too? Okay. okay. That's pretty much what he did. I'm going to keep it real. But sometimes when a man has gone that far down, it will get totally irrational. He's going to set himself up to be caught. That's, that's like a bank robber going in to rob the bank and giving the teller his, his license and leaving it with her. 
He's going to leave all of these personally identifiable items to hook up with her. She knows her father-in-law, doesn't she? Verse 19, she rose, went away, laid aside her veil, put on the garments. I'm sorry. The rest of verse 18. After he gives them to her, they got together. She gets pregnant. She leaves. Verse 20, Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, there says, Canaanite boy again, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he didn't find them. Ahira, I hooked up with this prostitute and I left my driver's license and credit card and car keys with her. Can you go back and get them for Okay. And she wasn't on the corner when Hira went back. <laughs> now they can't find her. Now we got a problem. That, that day after <laughs> consequence or so, didn't it? <laughs> Verse 22, he returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. Also, the men of the place said, wasn't no prostitute up around here. Uh Uh-oh. Verse 23, Jesus, ah, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. I sent her this young goat, and you couldn't find her. Verse 24, came to pass. Three months later, Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is pregnant because she played the harlot. Tamar, your daughter, Judah, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. That's disgusting. (laughs) She's not married. And now he's ready to execute the letter of the law. Burn her at the stake. You see the sinful hypocrisy that can take place in a human. He impregnated her. He had sex, but he's thinking she got with somebody else, and so my daughter-in-law should be killed. He's not owned up to anything he did. I'm, I'm not the, the, the sharpest person on the planet, but I, I just thought it took two people All right. All right. to cause these kind of pregnancies. Uh-huh. Remember in John 8 when the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, and they said, we caught her in the very act. Okay, I see her. If you caught her in the act, you know who the dude was. How come he ain't here? They didn't care about the law. They're trying to trap her and trap Jesus. And Jesus gave her another chance. Judah says, burn her, kill her. She's disgraced the family. This is a daughter-in-law, folks. Come on now. She was married to two of his sons. Killer. Wow. Isn't it fun to point out somebody else's sin? <laughs> Verse 25, when she was brought out, she sent her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I'm pregnant. Uh, Please determine who these belong to, the signet, the cord, and the staff. This is the guy who got me pregnant. Okay. Oh, that's my face on that driver. Oh, that's my face. Uh-oh. Verse 26. (laughs) Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Shelah, my son. And he never had sexual relations with her again. Let us see section two. Judah, like many today, was quick to impose God's standard of righteous living and judgment upon others while ignoring his own sin. Both participants in unbiblical sexual activity deserve judgment. 
And all of us should be forever grateful for the grace. Thank you, Jesus. All of us should be forever grateful for the grace yes, that didn't have us executed for the sin that we committed, that we deserve. Someone pointed out this is the first confession of sin in the book of Genesis. When Judas up, caught, she's been more righteous than I've been. Now, we, neither of them are really a good standard of righteousness. Let's, let's make that clear. <clears throat> but righteousness is a gift from God to us. It's offered by grace. It's offered by love. It's received by faith. In Romans 4, the Bible Reminds us Abraham believed God and it was counted to him, it was imputed to him. He was declared to be righteous because by faith he believed what God said. You can be declared righteous if you by faith believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was for your sin that he died. It was for your justification that he rose again. So without you doing anything right, God will declare you righteous by faith, by grace, because he loves you like that. Judas says, she's been more righteous than I have been. Let me hasten to say that from this ugly chapter on, Judah's going to be a transformed man. You're going to see him being concerned for others. You're going to see him being a leader in his family. You're going to see him being a reconciler. You're going to see him being a man of humility. You're going to see him being an agent of blessing. You're going to see him sacrificing. You're going to see him caring about his prayer. Turning point after a horrific act of sin. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. You know, Satan wanted to get Judah and Tamar killed. Through the, I mean, God's taken her out. He's taken Onan out. Satan knows the family line that's going to bring them aside. He's always trying to entice us to do something wrong so that either he can keep using us or God will take us off this earth and we can no longer be witnesses for Christ. Forgiven. Came to pass, verse 27, time to give birth came, twins were in her womb. So it was when she was giving birth, one put out his hand, the midwife put a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand. Obviously she was looking to identify who came out first, but then it happened, uh, verse 29, he drew back his hand, then his brother came out unexpectedly and said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. So his name was called... Perez, which means breach. <clears throat> then his twin comes out, Zerah, and they tell us that name means brilliance. He comes out with a scarlet thread on his hand. Isn't that a beautiful picture of Christ offering us his blood first because we sin first, and then later he comes back in brilliant glory to restore us. Let's look at a man who did it right. Genesis 39. Joseph was enduring constant mistreatment, yet God was with him and God prospered him. God has the right to put us to work for him whether we agree or not, and whether we understand or not. We should just trust him for the outcome. I put that header there just to remind you that Joseph did not want to be put into a pit and taken captive to be a slave in Egypt and spend all these years going through hard times to wind up being God's deliverer. He didn't ask for that. He wouldn't have signed up for that. But God is sovereign. And he can ask you to do something, or he can tell you to do something, or he can make you do something. Because he just got it like that. Joseph has gone from being the favored boy to being a slave in Egypt. Scripture says Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer, Pharaoh, captain of the guard, Egyptian, 
bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there, but the Lord, verse 2, was with Joseph. He was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. His master saw that the Lord was with him, that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Potiphar made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Favor. Joseph served so well that Potiphar's house, his business, everything was blossoming because of Joseph. Child of God, I hope that your boss starts to realize that it's because of your presence, your work excellence, your influence that things are going well for him, for her, because of you. Joseph does not have ideal working situations, but he's God's man in that place. And look at his influence. Do you realize that God often has you in a place that you don't want to be to be his change agent? So people can see there's something different about you and they start to want it? Everything was going well for Potiphar because Joseph was... And you see the text, all, all Potiphar knew was what he was having for dinner. Joseph's running everything. He was that good. By the favor of God. Joseph's a slave. He's captive. He's separated from family and friends. Yet God was with him and guaranteeing his success. Some situations look bad to us because we don't know what God is up to. The end of verse 6, the scripture tells us Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He is a good looking man. Verse 7, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master doesn't know what is with me in the house. He's, He's committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than me. He hasn't kept back anything from me but you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness? Please don't miss the end of this sentence and sin against God. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say against Potiphar. He didn't say against my employer. He didn't say, he said, First and foremost, this sexual sin would be a sin against the God I love and who has rescued me and saved me. I can't do it because of my walk with him. Potiphar has given me everything in this house, lady, but you, and he can't give me you because you belong to him. Now, I'm going to keep it real. Joseph's a good-looking man. Potiphar's wife knows that. She's approached him. And for a lot of guys, the male ego would have, I mean, right there. Toast. (laughs) It's only because of his commitment to the Lord that he was able to resist this temptation. But she didn't give up easily. Verse 10. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he didn't listen to her to lie with her or to be with her. 
She didn't just try to seduce him once. Over and oh, he's got to work there. He's got to look at her all the time. And she's saying, hey, it's just you and me here. I ain't going to tell if you don't. Remember how David thought nobody was ever going to find out he got it on with Bathsheba? That's in every language around the world. Everybody read about that, right? He thought nobody was going to find out. Folks have been reading about it for thousands of years. You don't want God putting you on the news for something you thought you could do undercover, okay? Joseph fought off sexual temptation by loving God enough to not sin against him and honoring the institution of marriage. He was under constant pressure, but he listened to God rather than the seductive voice of temptation. Have you learned that Satan's not going to tempt you with something you don't have a desire for or have a natural affinity to or an attraction to? He knows you. He's been watching you a long time. He, he knows how to dangle the right carrots in front of you. That's why you got to be walking close to the Lord to resist these sinful temptations. And please don't make your spouse lie. There is more than one good-looking man and woman in this world. So don't ask the questions that are just going to start some mess. <laughs> Do you think she's beautiful? The world knows she's beautiful. What am I supposed to say? No, I ain't even seen her. No. <laughs> Don't ask your spouse, um, who else would you marry in the church if I died? Don't ask them that. Because if you name somebody, now they're going to get suspicious. <laughs> Don't ask the question. You should be able to say, yes, she's beautiful. Yes, he's handsome. And your spouse should know that that doesn't mean you're going to chase him. Be honest. Okay? I don't know who needed that. So, so Potiphar's wife is going to keep going after Joseph. She's persistent, just like Satan is persistent. Verse 11 says, it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work. None of the men of the house was inside. It's just the two of them. Verse 12, she caught him by his garment and said, lie with me. He left his garment in her hand and ran outside. Look at letter C. This is the only feeling of the day. Satan knows he can get most people to fall by being persistent and seductive. Joseph teaches us that a seldom used method to avoid sexual sin, it works well. That is, a good run is better than a bad stand. All right. <laughs> <laughs> If it gets that hot and you know you can't resist, run for the hills. You say, no, we say, what kind of man are you? You can't handle, you can't run. Call back later and say why you ran, but get out of there while you can't. (laughs) You know your weak points. You've heard me say it over and over. I, I never had a temptation to drink. Lock me in a state store for a week. I'd probably die of thirst. I wouldn't last 10 minutes in the bakery section. <laughs> <laughs> know your weaknesses, okay? If you got to run, if you got to change job, Lord, I'm going to fall if I stay here. I feel weak. This yes. isn't the only job in the world. I can move. Yes. He'll honor your desire to not sin. Yes. But make sure that you want to do the right thing for the glory 
of God, because most folks just give in and hope there'll be no consequences. That doesn't work. <laughs> Remember Samson? Yes. Isn't it interesting, his first recorded words that I recall in script, he saw a woman. Get me this woman. First words that record. Ooh, I want her. What was his downfall? His inability to keep his hands off of women he had no business being with. The quote on your handout is from his conversation with Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up to her, said to her, entice him. Find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him so we can bind him and afflict him. Every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Delilah, seduce him. Find out why he's so strong. This is, this is the judge of Israel. He's beaten all of our folks. He, I didn't notice before, but apparently he didn't look like he lived in the gym because they probably would have assumed that's why he's so strong. You catch that? Find out why he's so strong. Apparently he didn't look like me. You know, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> But he had a supernatural strength. They didn't know where it came from. We each will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Find out why he's so strong. And so she kept pastoring him and trying to seduce him and going after him. And the text says it came to pass when she pastored him daily with her words and pressed, if you love me, you tell me. So that his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart. Said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head. I've been under Nazarite vow to God from my mother's womb. If I shave my hair, which is the symbol of his strength, my strength will leave me and I'll become weak just like any other man. And she took him down. Satan knows how to keep pushing the button and pushing the button. We have to decide, is this the time to make a good run rather than take a bad stand and be the next statistic? Joseph ran. Potiphar's wife now has his garment. Back to Genesis 39, Scripture says, so it was, verse 13, she saw he left his garment in her hand, ran outside. She called the men of her house, spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us, to laugh at us. He, he came into me and to lie with me. I cried out with a loud voice. He, he came in here trying to rape me, and I hollered for help. That is not what she did. Verse 15, it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out. He, he left his garment, ran out of here. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Verse 17, then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant who you brought to us came into me to humiliate me. So what happened is I lifted my voice and cried out. He left his garment with me and ran outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did this to me after this manner that his anger was aroused. Would, would, would you pause there? Look, look at letter D. We're almost done. Joseph did the right thing, but still suffered undeserved consequences. It's better to be lied upon than sin against the Lord and face his judgment. And oh, by the way, I think that if Potiphar had really, 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 really believed his wife, I think the slave Joseph would have been killed. But he just locked him up. I kind of think he knew his wife wasn't the most trustworthy woman. I think he knew that there's some guilt here that belongs to my bae. <laughs> 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 
And he knows as a husband, if he doesn't do something, now he got another argument to deal with. So he, he puts his right-hand man in prison, but he didn't kill him. See how God can protect you? He didn't remove Joseph because he wasn't done with his work for him, but he kept him alive. Many people have been killed over false accusations, in case you didn't know that. So again, it's better to be lied on and not commit the sin than just to keep doing it and think you're going to get away with it. Okay? We close with this. Verse 20, that Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. He was there in the prison, but, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison didn't look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. Whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. You see what God can do to somebody committed to him. He's running the business. He winds up in charge of everything. They put him in jail. And the jailkeeper trusts him to watch the other prisoners. That's a man of character. That's a man of favor. That's a man that's handling his business for the Lord. He had the same sexual desires that every other person had, but he said, the reason I'm not going to do this is because I refuse to sin against my God. Wow. Joseph remained faithful in spite of enduring unfair treatment. The Lord kept showing him favor, blessing, and promotion. Does that sound like your situation? Very quick, quickly, 1 Corinthians 6 Read this and we're done. Thank you for giving me a few extra moments today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Corinthians were so caught up in their sex sexuated society that to become sexually after, active, they called you a Corinthian. That was just what they did. And so they had just... Felt like there's nothing else for me to do with my body but to eat and have sex. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things aren't helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And here's one of the many places where Paul quotes something they've said to him so that he can correct them theologically. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food. But God will destroy both it and them. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. The Corinthians had these saying, well, food was made for my stomach. My stomach was made for food. Sex was made for my body. My body was made for sex. Right? It's natural, right? Paul says, No. Do you not know, verse 15, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Of course not. God forbid. Do you not know that he who was joined to a harlot is one body with her? For he said the two shall become one flesh. He who was joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. He commits sexual immorality, sins against his own body. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting someone else. Don't you know, verse 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God? You are not your own. Stop saying it's my body. I can do what I want to do with it. Your body belongs to the Lord. He gave it to you. To serve him, he is still the rightful owner. He didn't yeah. give you that body to sin against him. Yeah. He gave you that body to enjoy life and serve him. But he says, I inhabit your body. Do not use it for sinful purposes. Yeah. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. 
They belong to him. Yes. I close with this. Are you missing out on what God really wants to do in your life because you refuse to honor him with your body and with your desires? Are you sacrificing a blessed future for momentary satisfaction? If sin didn't feel good, we wouldn't do it so much. But the bill's going to come. It's fun to charge stuff. I, I told my wife, I said, I love signing my name. Just <laughs> going home with everything I want. And then a few weeks later, here comes the credit card. Something wrong when the mailman has to use both hands to carry your, your bill. You know? So it may feel good at the moment, but would you think ahead? You're sinning against the Lord in the moment. You're sinning against yourself. It's, it's going to come back and bite you. You're going to regret. It's better to learn to live in holiness and trust God to give you the satisfaction that you're trying to steal at that moment. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us how out of control we are apart from you. Thank you, Lord, that you stopped all of us from doing some of the things we thought about doing. Thank you that you didn't kill us while we were sinning against you time and time again. Thank you that you are our rescuer, our redeemer, that you're able to, to use us after all of our failures. I just pray, Lord, from this moment on that each of us would, would learn to submit ourselves to you, to embrace the work of the Holy Spirit and sanctified living uh, to discover, Lord, that holiness is so much better than living in sin. Lord, let this be a turning point today, a breakthrough today. Just let this be a day of deliverance. Lord, for those who need to run from sin, would you help them? For those who just need to stand strong, would you help them? For all of us, Lord, help us to just learn to love you more and to do what you want us to do and trust you for the outcome. Help us to be the men and women of God that you called us to be. Help you. We pray your spirit would just take over each and every one of us. Let this be a day of life change and transformation for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you.